So I want to I want to try to develop a, a feel and understanding of um, three-dimensional geometry and topology, and uh, I mean particularly. Well, I mean I think there's some parts of the theory that that are you know might be on occasion usable by by other people and that's I think what's what's important. I mean what is what is our aim in doing mathematics? It's not just to prove theorems for our own satisfaction. I think ultimately the test of mathematics is the extent to which it can be recycled and used in other in other places. Okay, um, anyway, so let's is there some long white chalk? Oh, under the bottom. Okay. It's a, it's a little test. I want to briefly go back to two dimensions to, because the picture of um, three-dimensional geometry and topology is more complicated and it always helps to start with the simplest possible things. Um, well, we could even go back to one dimension for that matter. In one dimension, the only closed one manifold is a circle, and you can think of this as R modulo Z, I guess. It's, a, it's the Euclidean line modulo translations. I think actually I struggled over this for, for, for quite a while in school, if I go back and think honestly about it. I mean, do you recall, I mean, when we talked about, when I, when I was learning about angles, what is an angle? There was a lot of, there was a long sort of song and dance about, you know, as an angle, it's between zero and 359.9999, or is it, is it defined modulo 360 or, or what? Anyway, that's, there, I think there was a long, long discussion and confusion about the difference between you know, the concept of a circle versus R modulo C. And it's definitely helpful to think of R modulo Z equals a circle. Now it's just, to me, instantaneous, probably to you. <laughs> but, um, but I don't think it was to my school teachers. Um, okay, that's one dimension, <laughs> just to show I can. Now we can get warmed up a little bit. Okay, two dimensions. Um, so in two dimensions, there are more surfaces. There's more two manifolds. Um, there's, there's a two sphere, which is very round. Um, what does it mean to be very round? Well, it looks, looks the same in every direction. Every point looks the same as any other point, but not only that, you can spin it around any point. There is a torus, and, and this, I mean, in, in the two sphere, is the locus of a kind of geometry. I mean, you're given two points, you can connect any two points by a straight line. There's a notion of spherical triangles. There's a whole sort of nice theory of two-dimensional spherical <coughs> geometry. So it is, in some sense, a geometry. Here's a, a torus T2, which is round. <laughs> um, and, and again, the best way to think of the torus, a good way to think of a torus, there's never a best way, because there's always multiple ways to think of anything. But a good way to think of a torus is that this is the plane, or, or I mean, Perhaps better think of it as the Euclidean plane. That means the plane equipped with a metric modulo an action of z squared. So we take, we just take the plane and divide it by a group of translations that gives you a torus up to homeomorphism. In some in some ways, this you know this picture is often more illuminating than this picture. I mean, for instance. On the torus here, I mean, w one question about surfaces is always to understand simple closed curves on a surface. There's a simple closed curve like this. There's a simple closed curve like this. Those correspond to this curve and to this curve. But now, in this picture, you can also see that, I mean, 
So all these vertices represent the same vertex. You can also see there's a simple closed curve like this, like this, like this. There's a whole, <laughs> wait, um, you know, there's a whole, whole range of these different curves. Over here, it's a little harder to see, even to see the curve that, you know, that goes diagonally on this square. It goes like this or, you know, so on. Anyway, I mean, certain things are easier to see in the plane than on the torus. And I think this model is often used, for instance, in studying dynamics, dynamical systems, where the configuration space can often turn out to be a torus, as in the Earth, moon, sun system. Um, and then there's a whole sequence of other surfaces, the two-hold torus, three-hold torus. The, in the, this sequence is, is the sequence of all closed-oriented surfaces. And now, so, so this, this is modeled on spherical geometry. This is modeled on Euclidean geometry. And, and all, the, all the remaining infinite sequences of surfaces are, are related to two-dimensional hyperbolic geometry, which one can think of as the geometry of the interior of a disk, where straight lines are these circles orthogonal to the boundary circle. And this model, this Poincaré disk model of the hyperbolic plane, angles are correctly portrayed. Distances are not correctly portrayed. Um, one way to think of the scaling for distances is that if you, if you take a line like this, if we, if we want to draw a railroad track in the hyperbolic plane, this diameter of the circle is an example of a straight line. In a, in a curve, if you displace the line, the constant distance to the side, it, it looks like a curve in this picture. I mean, it is curved in the hyperbolic plane also. So these, these two are, these are curves a constant distance from the, um, from the center line. And so to draw a railroad track, it would be something like this. You'd, you have to do this so the shapes between the railroad ties are approximately constant, like so. And they, they actually start converging. In this area, they, they get smaller exponentially fast as you go along the train. So if you, if you want to watch a mo hyperbolic movie of a train in this picture, it looks like zero size for a long time. Then it sort of exponentially expands and then exponentially contracts. And then it looks like zero size in this model, or almost zero. You know, and in some way, this is, this is forced by the nature of hyperbolic geometry. That, um, anyway. This is the hyperbolic plane. I'm assuming most people have seen it or know it. And you can, um, and for any of these other surfaces, for any of these other surfaces, you can represent them hyperbolically by, um, by, by taking a regular, um, um, 2g minus 2 gone. Anyway, you t taking 4g, whatever. Anyway, you take some regular polygon, an octagon in this case, a 12 gone in this case, and, and you glue the sides. I guess it's 4g minus 4. You, you, 4. 4g gone, thank you. 4g gone, right. You, you glue the sides sort of alternately. I mean, this one goes to this one. 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 And so on. And that, and that gives you topologically a picture of the surface. Um, unfortunately, fortunately or unfortunately, there's a lot of freedom in, in, in how you might do this. I mean, just as for the torus, you're not forced to take a square. You can take a, a parallelogram of any shape and, and you obtain a torus, and the study of possible shapes for the torus is a very interesting and profound theory. Um, um, and similarly, you can take 
You can take polygons of many different shapes to form hyperbolic structures for all these surfaces. But for right now, I guess the main lesson is that all these surfaces fit into one of three camps. They're, Euclidean, they're spherical, Euclidean, or hyperbolic, where most things are hyperbolic. And there are many, many qualitative consequences of the classification of a surface. So whenever, I mean, surfaces can arise in many different contexts. Sometimes this sort of division doesn't make much difference, but very often it does. And, and there's big qualitative differences between the Euclidean case, the spherical case, and the general case, which is hyperbolic. OK, so for three manifolds, um, one has, well, there are examples of, of all these three phenomena. They're, the set of examples is more complicated. But let me just give, quickly just give one example from each, each of these three camps of, to, to try to get a sense of what they're like. OK, so for the. Um, for the case of the three torus, you can again take, you can take a cube and identify opposite faces, just identify it by a translation, and this gives a, a three torus. There are, there's, there's a finite small number of other other examples, but there, I won't confuse you by trying to do it. Well, let me just give one, I will confuse you by giving one example. Um, we can identify this face to this face. We can identify this face to this face. I mean, OK, the two sides and the top and bottom are just identified by translations. But now, and I'm going to identify the front face to the back face, but but now, when, you, when I do it, I can take this face and glue it to this face with a one-quarter rotation. So this gives another example of some three-dimensional manifold obtained by identifying the sides of a cube. <coughs> um, and this three-dimensional manifold also comes, has a Euclidean structure. It has this, the, it, it, this, this Construction gives to it a Riemannian metric or a local geometry, which is locally indistinguishable from Euclidean space, but it's different from the three torus because in the three torus, if I walk in any, if I see my image and walk in any direction toward my image, when I arrive, when I arrive there, I, I'm turned. If I'm not twisting as I go, I arrive in the same orientation, but. In this particular manifold, if I, you know, if I go out, start at one wall and walk out to the other wall, when I, when I arrive in, I'm, um, I'm walking on my side. So you just immediately see that. I forget how many of these there are, 11 or so, or 11 or 14, or it depends how you count. <laughs> anyway, there, there's a number of different ways to get these three-dimensional Euclidean manifolds. Now, one way to get a, a three-dimensional spherical <laughs> manifold is just to take, take the three-sphere, which you can think of as the set of x, y, z, w in R4, such that x squared plus y squared plus z squared plus w squared equals 1. Um, I think, I mean, I, re I recollect you know, reading some discussion of the three sphere where this was the definition. And I really struggled to try to, in some sense, understand what it looked like. But uh, um, a, better, a better way to, 
I mean, in order to visualize it, in order to, I mean, this is a way to describe it with little symbols. And you could do a lot of things with these little symbols. But a way to think of yourself as inside the three sphere is you imagine what it would be like to live there. So, um, so you can think of, so if the world was the three sphere, if the universe is the three sphere, that would mean that um, if you go far enough in any direction, a certain distance in any direction, you arrive at the antipodal point. So topologically, this is the same as taking the one point compactification of R3 to the point at infinity. Um, but you can go further and try to imagine, really imagine what, well, let's add vision to this. What, what, what does vision look like? What would you see in the three sphere? So, um, so here you are, here are your two eyes. Light travels in straight lines. So on the two sphere, if you start at any point and take any two geodesics, they arrive back at the antipodal point. If they keep going, they arrive back where you are. So, so if you're standing here, I mean, this is a pretty good picture of what it is. If you're standing here and you look off into the distance, what you see is a huge image of, um, of your head turned inside out. Well, I mean, <laughs> look in that direction, and I'll see the back of my head there. If I look up, I'll see my feet. But it's all sort of totally turned out inside out, way in the distance. Of course, optically, you don't really distinguish between things that are far away and close up. And, um, so, so an object, optically, an object right, right here in front of your face looks exactly the same as if the object was, it took its antipodal image. So, so, so and, and um, in fact, when you go to, when, when you try out these three-dimensional spherical flight simulators on graphics workstations like an SGI, you, you find it very, very confusing to try to distinguish between images that are near the antipodal point and images that are near you. So if, if, if I have a friend, if you're my friend or something and you're here and I bore you too much so you start walking away, well, as, as you walk away you start receding inside, diminishing inside and distance, but then as you get farther away you start increasing again till, till you look like when you get as far away as you can be, it looks like you're right immediately adjacent. And I don't know if there's a moral to this in <laughs> politics or what, but um, um, anyway, that's what happens. Well, let's give another example of a, of a three-dimensional spherical manifold. So th this is a famous example that was, um, it seems to recur all over the place. Well, I mean, in many forms, the Poincaré dodecahedral space. This, I mean, as the name suggests, it was discovered by Poincaré, or described by, or was it? Oh, I'm not sure of the exact history. Poincaré, I think, gave this description of it as a counterexample to one of his formulations of the Poincaré conjecture. So you, um, if you take a dodecahedron, and now, so instead of a cube, instead of identifying the faces of a cube, you identify faces of a dodecahedron. Now identify each face to each opposite face. Um, well, so you can't make up quite so simple a rule as on the, uh, for the torus because you can't, you can't just glue, you can't just translate each face to the opposite face to glue it. These faces are sort of twisted from each other out of phase, so you have to, have to impart some twist. But you can make a rule where you identify a face to the opposite face by the minimum possible twist, namely a one-tenth um, right-handed revolution. And you'll find if you, if I took this figure and flipped it around back, up back to front so that this edge was here, it would look in the same position. So seeing a right-handed a right-handed twist is, is sort of well defined as a relation between two edges. Do that for each of the pairs of faces. And this creates some 
three manifold. I mean, just to show what's involved. And this is checking, checking these gluing patterns is something that's very, very easy for computers, but gets confusing for humans. But anyway, here, I mean, here's how it goes. So this, uh, when you glue this face to the back face, this edge gets glued to this edge here. But now, um, but this edge is also an edge of, so it goes to A to A prime in the back. But, that, but this edge is also a, 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 an edge of this face. And this face in the front top gets glued to the face at the bottom back by, again, a, a one-tenth right-handed twist. And what does that one-tenth right-handed twist do? It sort of you know, it goes down and twist as little as possible. So that edge also gets, so when you glue this face to the face at the bottom, it takes that edge to that edge. But now, um, but now the edge here is also an edge of this front lower left face, which gets glued to the back upper right face. And in doing that, I have to see what a, oh yeah, this one. I have to do a one-tenth positive, a one-tenth right-handed twist. And so it goes to there. And you can see that this edge goes back to this one. So I get a cycle of three edges all glued together. If I, in, in the identification space, after do it, gluing all those, if I check what happens, you could think of this edge like this with, well, there'll be, there'll be three flanges coming out, or three pentagons. I mean, this is sort of a picture. And, um, and this, hap this happens to every edge because the gluing rule is totally symmetric. Now, what happens to a vertex is actually a consequence of this. Um, if you think of a little neighborhood of a vertex, then around this edge, there will be three other, the, this little neighborhood of a vertex is the, you can think of it as determined by a little triangle. If you, if you intersect with a little sphere, it intersects in a small little spherical triangle. And, and then each vertex of this tri cross-section triangle corresponds to an edge here. There are, there are three, other, three other corners that are glued around there, so that means there are three other spherical triangles like so, but that's true for each of these vertices. So, so this is a picture this is a picture of what's called the link of the vertex. It just looks like that. In other words, there are four edges coming together in, in six of these little membranes, and they all come together at the vertex. So the vertices get glued together in fours. There are 20. You know, the dodecahedron has 12 faces, but 20 vertices. So 20 divided by 4 is an integer 5, so it's all consistent. There'll be five vertices when you've identified. And um, it gives you some kind of, this goes to show that it gives some kind of three-dimensional manifold. Now, to make it a geometric manifold, you see that um, if, you take a, if you take a regular dodecahedron and look at its, look at the angle, the dihedral angle here, it's, it's a little, it's not equal to 120 degrees. It's a little less than 120 degrees. If, in other words, if you take three of them, and if I take three dodecahedron and put them around, put, it, you know, put them around the edge, they sort of almost fit, but they don't exactly fit. They're a little bit too little. Um, if you haven't seen this, I, it's, it's a good uh, exercise to try it. But if we pass over to three-dimensional spherical geometry, then, then angles of dodecahedrons in three-dimensional spherical geometry are a little bigger than angles of, of the dodecahedron in Euclidean space. And in fact, you see, in, in three-dimensional spherical geometry, 
if you take a big enough, if you start with a point and take bigger and bigger two spheres around that point, when they get to be of radius pi over 2 or 90 degrees, it's like an equatorial, equatorial, um, it's totally geodesic in other words. And, and if you take a dodecahedron with vertices on, inscribed in that sphere, then the edges also lie on that sphere. So in other words, if you take a big enough dodecahedron in the three sphere, the angles are all pi. And when you take a very tiny three dodecahedron, the angles are just limit on the values for Euclidean space. So by the intermediate value theorem, somewhere in between, there's one that's exactly right, that exactly fits in the three sphere with angles of 120 degrees. Now you can take that very dodecahedron and glue the opposite faces together in this pattern, and it gives you a spherical structure. It gives you a, a structure for that manifold that will make a space that locally is indistinguishable from the three sphere, but globally it's different. And another way to say this is that if you, if you, take, this, if you take this dodecahedron, right, if you're standing in this manifold and suppose you have these, you haven't totally erased the walls, but you make them out of glass, you look at it, it's indistinguishable from what it would be like inside the three sphere itself, but where you pack the three sphere with copies of the dodecahedron of 120 degree angles. And it turns out that if you do that, if you take this dodecahedron that's exactly the size, whose angles are 120 degrees, if you put another one on top and another one on top of that, and you keep going, on the tenth, after you've created 10 of those, the 11th one is back where you start. And, and the whole entire three sphere is filled up exactly by 120 of these regular dodecahedra. There's, oh, there's a lot more. So, so the, in particular, this is related to the a polyhedron in four dimensions, which has 120 faces, each of which is a dodecahedron. There's a lot of, a lot of lore related to this, a lot of beautiful pictures, but it's just one example of, this also just gives one example of a three-dimensional manifold with a geometric structure. What would it look like to live in there? Well, you'd see, if you live there, you'd see 120 o images of any, any, any object, exactly 120, except that in pairs, some of them would be identical to each other. And I mean, you can imagine you live in this room, you look up to the next one, and you just see a copy of yourself, but twisted by one-tenth of a, one-tenth of a rotation in each of the adjacent cells. Sort of amazing that it works. Now, the, um, there's one more example now, just to start getting the building blocks for three manifolds. I can take this, I can take a dodecahedron And, and now take other, there are many other possible rules for identifying sides of the dodecahedron that will give three-dimensional three manifolds. And one of the, well, but there's only one other rule which is perfectly symmetric, and that is you, in, you, each, you glue each face to its opposite face, but instead of using a one-tenth rotation, you use a three-tenths rotation. And if, you, and if you do this, I think I won't, I won't trace it all out, but if you do this rule, it turns out that um, edges will be glued together in groups of five rather than in groups of three. And all the vertices will be glued to a single vertex, It'll, it'll end up that it'll end up that a neighborhood of the vertex looks like the cone on an icosahedron, which is made of 20 triangles. I won't I won't check it out, test it out. Anyway, in order to in order to make this manifold in a geometric way, instead of using 
spherical dodecahedron or a Euclidean dodecahedron, you have to find a dodecahedron whose angles are now um, 2 pi over 5, 72 degrees. And to do that, you use the fact that in, hyper in, um, in three-dimensional hyperbolic geometry, angles are a little less than they are in, um, in, in Euclidean geometry, sort of opposite from how it goes to the three-sphere. And um, I'm having trouble drawing it. Anyway, if you take a giant, if you take the biggest possible dodecahedron, its angles are 60 degrees, it turns out. If, they're, if the vertices are all the way out on the, on the sort of sphere at infinity. But anyway, somewhere in between there, there's some dodecahedron here whose angles are 72 degrees in hyperbolic, three-dimensional hyperbolic geometry. And you can create this space. You can make a hyperbolic manifold out of this space. And this is called the Seifert Faber dodecahedral space. This gives an example of a three-dimensional hyperbolic manifold. Of course, yeah, I think, I mean, it may seem like these examples are very special, but they're, it's just that the examples that are simple, the simplest examples to construct are, are simple, so they're special. But there are there are zillions of other examples, many other examples. And um, to start, I want to start building up the, okay, the, the more general theory of three-dimensional geometry and topology. <laughs> so I, I've mentioned here three kinds of geometries. There are three kinds of two-dimensional geometry, but it turns out that these aren't really sufficient for, to get, in, in, in two dimensions, hyperbolic geometry is sort of the generic case, by far the most common. These aren't sufficient. These, I've given examples of those three kinds in three dimensions, but they're not sufficient to get all, to understand all three dimensional manifolds. It turns out there are eight kinds of, of three-dimensional geometry that are needed for three manifolds. But of these eight, hyperbolic geometry is by far is the generic case. In a way, it would be nicer if there were 89 kinds of geometry, because then, then it wouldn't be necessary to talk about all the other 88. See, 8 is a small enough number that if you don't say anything about it, it seems like you're being cheated, I guess. Um, I'm going to briefly say what, what the other ones are. So, so there's... Um, Euclidean geometry, spherical geometry, and hyperbolic geometry. <coughs> These are three-dimensional ones. Now, all the other kinds of geometry, th these are the three kinds of geometry that are totally homogeneous and isotropic. In other words, these, these, these geometric spaces, they're homogeneous spaces. You could say Riemannian geometric homogeneous spaces, but they have the property that they look the same at any point and in any direction in that point, and you can also twist in any direction. I mean, the, the group of isometries in each case is six dimensional. The other ones are all somehow built up from two dimensions. So for instance, there's the geometry of the two sphere across the line. And there's, there's one there's essentially one three manifold, or yeah, there's essentially one, well, 
or two three manifolds that, 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 that need this kind of geometry. Namely, if you take, well, I mean, basically, if you take the two sphere across the circle, this is equal to S2 cross E1 modulo a translation. So, in order to be complete, you kind of need this geometry, but it's not nearly as important. There's also two dimensional hyperbolic geometry across a line. Um, now, there's also a kind of geometry that's similar to this, but twisted, a twisted hyperbolic geometry across a line, where or really this is the geometry, if you take, if you take the, um, if you take the bund, if you take the hyperbolic plane and consider all unit length vectors in the hyperbolic plane, or the unit tangent bundle, the hyperbolic plane, this is called. So, so the set of all unit length tangent bundles is, is like for each point in the hyperbolic plane, you have a circle, but these circles don't, geometrically, they don't fit together just like in a product. They, the curvature of the hyperbolic plane gives it a kind of twisting. Or, or we can take the universal cover if we like. Anyway, this is another geometry that's used for many, th an infinite number of three manifolds, but still they're very rare. Okay, so I've done one, two, three, four, five, six, and then um, there's the, what's called nil geometry. This is a certain, the geometry of a certain nilpotent Lie group, the Heisenberg group, three-dimensional Heisenberg group, and then there's something called solve geometry, which is the geometry of a certain three-dimensional solvable Lie group. And these are both related to, well, they're, I mean, these are both an extension of sort of a Euclidean group by another Euclidean group. They have dimensions one and two, but in different orders. I won't say too much. Okay, so those, those are eight kinds of geometry you need to understand three manifolds. Um, and the conjecture is, I think, pretty well supported by evidence by now, that all three manifolds can be built up from these three, these eight kinds of geometry. Um, I need to say what more, what terms. Um, I'll define terms a little bit. I'll be a little more formal here. What is a geometry? I mean, I, I guess I've said what they are, what the answers are, saying what the question to which they answer is harder. Anyway, you can think of a geometry as a, as a space, the space x, I want to, I, I want to assume that x is simply connected just to keep them from proliferating. Um, to, and there's a group G acting on x. The stabilizer of any point is compact. There's another way to say this is that this group is acting such that there exists a Riemannian metric on x. There exists a metric on x that's invariant by g. And so the g, um, and g is transitive. In other words, g takes every point, any point x to any other point x, there's some element of G that does that. Okay, so this is a geometry. Um, now, there are a lot of, there's still an infinite, there's an infinite number of three-dimensional spaces x together with a G. I mean, there's still an infinite number of different ones with this classification. But the things, to get, the kinds of geometry needed for three dimensions, for three-dimensional manifolds, 
one simplification is gotten by saying we can assume G is maximal. In other words, there's no larger G acting on X with the same properties. And also, assume that there exists um, some um, subgroup, well, it's a discrete subgroup gamma in G such that X modulo gamma is a compact three manifold. In other words, there's actually an infinite, uh, an infinite number of different Js that have the property that they're not, they're not suitable for modeling any possible three manifold. They don't give, they, they don't, they're not a geometry that works for three manifolds. But if you, if you put on these two conditions, then, then it turns out there's eight, there's only eight answers, only eight different kinds of geometry. And the conjecture is that these eight are sufficient for building up all three-dimensional manifolds. You know, building up, well, I have to say what building up means. Okay, so there's, so one way you can get a three manifold from one of these geometries is precisely by taking a discrete subgroup of G that acts, that has a compact quotient and that acts with no fixed points. And it, um, I mean, there are many, many three manifolds obtained by taking, by that construction, just as um, the three torus is, is R3 modulo Z cubed. The, this, this Poincare dodecahedral space is the three sphere modulo, modulo this group of, a group of order 120, which is really the, it's also known as the, it's a binary icosahedral group, the central extension of the icosahedral group. And, and the cipher favor space is, is um, the cipher favor space up there is hyperbolic three space modulo some infinite group. So you get, by taking these eight kinds of geometry there, there's a certain set of discrete groups that act on them that give many three manifolds. And for all but, for all but hyperbolic three space, you can exactly classify, you can give a very explicit classification of what all the possible groups are. But, there, but that's not, but to build up three manifolds, you need more operations than just that. So I want to describe I want to describe some operations. So one operation is um, is the is the following. We could take we could take one three manifold, for instance, the three torus. Well, okay, I'll bring these back down. We could take one th three manifold, for instance, the three torus. We could take another three manifold, for instance, this Poincare dodecahedral space. And, and you can form the, uh, the operation known as the connected sum. It's written with this sharp. So M1 connected sum M2 is, is the operation I will describe. This is the um, soothsayers, or somehow the, the seers operation. You, you, um, you have this world over here, the Euclidean world, and you have this other magical world, the Poincare dodecahedral world. And over here, you, there's a crystal ball. And over here, there's another crystal ball. And you, 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 stand, you come here and you sort of gaze into the crystal ball and, and you see out from here. So in other words, you, you, formally speaking, you, 
you take M1, take any embedded three, embedding of the three ball into M1, take M2, take any embedding of the three ball into M2, there's an orientation issue here, and, and we, you remove these two three balls, the boundaries are two spheres, and you glue the two, two spheres together. And it turns out that if, if the two three manifolds are oriented, this is a well-defined operation. It's known as M1 connected sum M2. And we can do this an arbitrary number of times. Well, so it turns out that in three dimensions, this operation is, um, is essentially reversible. In, in other dimensions, it's not so. But in three dimensions, um, I guess a, there's a theorem, I guess this is due to Knazer, that um, any three manifold <coughs> has a decomposition as a connected sum of a finite number of indecomposable pieces and that the, and that the pieces and that the pieces up to homeomorphism are are um, are canonical, are unique, are defined by the original manifold. Inde indecomposable simply means that it, if you express it, oh, oh yeah. So, so the operation of connected sum is a, is a semigroup operation. It's a, I mean, there's three manifolds, n manifolds in general, oriented n manifolds in general form a um, semigroup, and a, a commutative semigroup under connected sum the n sphere acts as the identity element, so it's a monoid, really. And um, indecomposable means that if you express it as a connected sum, then one of the two pieces is a is a um, sphere. Or another way to say it is that I, that's that's good enough. That's how I'll say it. So, in other words, in three dimensions, if you look at the um, the mon monoid of three manifolds under connected sum up to um, up to homeomorphism. Well, every element has infinite order, and and they commute anyway. There's a you know there's a canonical set of generators. It's just the free monoid on the on the free commutative monoid on an infinite set of generators, namely these indecomposable pieces. So these are called prime. A three-manifold, which can't be decomposed into connected sum, is called prime. And it's an analogy to integers under multiplication, which form a monoid of exactly the same structure, which is you know, it's isomorphic to this. So the problem of understanding three-manifolds then reduces to the problem of understanding prime three manifolds. So the things which are not prime never have these, well, except with one exception, they never have a geometric structure. The one exception is P3 connected some P, the real projective three space connected some real projective three space has an S2 cross S1 structure. Other than that, they never have they never have a geometric structure. So we may as well just look at prime three manifolds. Okay, so this is the first sense. But there's another, there's another operation to complicate life. It's analogous to this prime decomposition, but it's, it uses toruses or it uses Euclidean two manifolds. So, so you know, in some way the Hyperbolic geometry is generic. This prime decomposition says any time you find a, an essential, like, two-dimensional spherical submanifold of a three-manifold, it, it says something about the three-manifold. I mean, it, it, that gives rise to this prime decomposition. So, you know, if I had this connected sum of a torus and a 
punk radio to cathedral space. In order to undo it, I would search for, for a copy of the two-sphere, namely the surface of that crystal ball, and then one of two-sphere, which doesn't bound to three-ball, that would say that it, you know, it, it, it's essential, it fits in there. So, and if I find it, and if it chops the manifold into two pieces, then I chop, and I get a, a decomposition. Well, there's, this, there's another decomposition. Um, the Jacob Shale and Johansson decomposition, which is exactly, which is pretty analogous, but, um, but using Euclidean two manifolds instead of spherical two manifolds. In other words, given a three manifold You ask, are there any essential embedded tori, toruses? In other words, copies of the two torus. What does it mean to be essential? Well, you can always embed a two torus like that as a you know, little boundary of a solid torus. This is called not essential. This example is not essential because there's a curve on the two torus, which is the boundary of the disk in the three manifold. An essential embedded torus is an embedding of a torus in a three manifold so that no non trivial curve on the two torus bounds a disk in the three manifold, neither like that nor like that. I guess that's not the not symbol, is it? There. There. No, there's no essential embedded disks. And so there's a there's a certain way to to canonically Given a three manifold, there's a certain way to canonically cut the three manifold along essential embedded toruses. It's, I mean, the real way to do it is a little bit delicate, although you could just, if, you, if you're not too worried about getting a canonical answer when you've cut up, you could just cut along every essential, cut along a set of essential embedded toruses until you can't do it any longer. But there is a kind of canonical way to do it. And you get a certain set of three manifolds by cutting along these essential two manifolds. But the three manifolds now have, um, you can think of them as having boundary components which are two toruses. They have boundaries which are unions of two toruses. Of course, this might, this might be empty. There might not be any of them, but it's you know, something like this. Anyway, there's a canonical set of pieces you get like this. And now the, so the conjecture is, <coughs> Conjecture or the geometrization conjecture says that um, every piece obtained by the, the sort of prime decomposition, which is cutting along two spheres. followed by the torus decomposition, has a geometric structure. As I said, this is now backed by a lot of evidence. Um, See, it's, time is rapidly draining out of the late hour. Um, maybe I'll just give one example of a, of a class of three manifolds for which, for which you can say something wh wh where this is known to be true, 
and where it says something about the structure that, that's maybe visible. So an example where known is the complement of a knot or a link. Um, so for example, I mean, if you take a typical knot of which <laughs> the first example of a typical knot is the figure eight knot, like this. You take S3 minus this figure eight knot, this is equal to, this has a hyperbolic structure <coughs> of finite volume. If you take, um, there's, there's one simpler knot, namely the trefoil knot, the trefoil knot, like this, S3 minus the trefoil knot um, is, has a, let's say, an H2 cross E1 structure. If you take, if you, if you take something like this figure eight knot, and then take a what's called the whitehead double. That means you go like this. You replace the string by a, another string that winds around and just links with itself. Um, th this is an example of a knot. The complement of this knot has a non-trivial torus decomposition. Namely, you can so you can you can find an Im essential embedded torus that um, that winds around like so. That, in other words, that you take a thickened neighborhood of the original knot, and its boundary is a torus which separates the three sphere minus the knot into two pieces. The outside is just equivalent to the complement of the figure eight knot. And that has a well, hyperbolic structure which one can, I mean, which, which has been written down, which can be fairly readily described. The inside part, inside this torus, is equivalent actually to, um, I mean, to see what it is, I can take this. This, this solid torus minus the knot. I mean, I can take the so inner solid torus and embed it any way I like in the three sphere. In particular, I can embed it like this in the, the solid torus here minus the knot is the same. I mean, this picture is homeomorphic to this picture. But now, uh, uh, the interior of a solid torus is equivalent in the three s to the complement of a circle in the three sphere. So. So, in fact, um, so that particular example is, um, is equivalent to the complement of this link made of two circles, one trivial circle like here and one, one that just links with itself. This is known as the Whitehead link. It also has a very explicit hyperbolic structure. This is an example of how the torus decomposition works. It's kind of rare, in fact, that, that, that you can decompose a knot, that the complement of a knot decomposes in this way. In this instance, it's called a satellite knot. The theorem about knots, if you want to be per perfectly explicit, is that um, if, you, if you have a knot, then if it's a satellite knot, the torus decomposition is non-trivial. If, if, it's a, if it's a generalization of this, I mean, this, is a, this trefoil knot is a special case of a knot which can be put on the surface of a torus, like those curves I was talking about before. Well, I, that's a bad example, but 
This is a curve which winds twice around the torus, one the short way, well, three, twice around the long way, well, three times around the short way. So a, in general, a torus knot always has a structure which is like an H2 cross E1. But if you have a knot which is not a torus knot and which is not a satellite knot, in other words, it doesn't wind around the bigger knot like this, then the theorem says its complement admits a hyperbolic structure of finite volume. And, um, and there's some really nice computer programs that work on just about any computer, but in particular on a Macintosh, that um, you can draw a picture of the knot and, and it will find it for you. And from the picture of the hyperbolic structure, you can identify the knot. Thanks. Um, any questions for today? I'll say more tomorrow. Why are there only a countable number of prime irreducible? Three manifolds. Well, if you take three manifolds to be, I mean, it turns out every three manifold has a triangulation but it can be decomposed into tetrahedra. And there's only a countable number of ways to glue together tetrahedra. Uh, I mean, they, I'm really talking about compact things, although yeah, for non-compact things, there'd be an uncountable number of practically any kind of manifold, even surfaces. But I'm talking about compact ones. There's only a countable number of ways to glue together tetrahedra. Other questions? Uh-huh. Let's see that. Uh, yes. 